So when I talk about backcountry camping with kids, I don't necessarily mean, you know, pack up and get the kilometers behind you and get out and you're doing 12 portages a day and you're like three week old. It's like, oh my God, no. We were, we were sitting at home, honestly, we didn't think we were gonna be able to do this at three weeks. My recovery was going well. All he did was eat and sleep and poop. And we're like, oh, well we could do that sitting on a campsite. One image is Mike and I went up into Wabakimi for a few weeks and we got really ahead of ourselves, thought we were the greatest whitewater paddlers in the whole world, ended up swamping, Mike was sterning, and that's us. <laughs> I'm just pointing that out, and he is actually a better whitewater paddler than me, I'm just going to say that. Um, we ended up, you know, having to dry out all of your stuff. Don't want to do that with kids. Um, our wanigans are our end tables, they're Dylan's toy boxes, like, they're out. So he's immersed and surrounded by this gear all the time, and that brings a really great level of comfort to it, so oftentimes it's not new. So if there's a familiarity that you can create with your kids before they get out on trail, Awesome. A lot of you I know camp in the backyard first. Great. Have a special little camp out. They can use their new sleeping bag, their new thermarest, what have you. The voyagers would often stop and uh, they would paddle for about three hours and they'd have a pipe. So you can see these guys smoking and telling jokes. And the distances on the Ottawa River started to be called a three pipe day or a five pipe day. They never they never talked about the distances in terms of, so next time you're coasting along in your canoe smoking your pipe, maybe you could remember that. There were 18 portages between Lachine Rapids in Montreal, which was the beginning of the uh, fur trading uh, route, to the junction of the Mattawa River. We almost had a canal system on the Ottawa River. A lot of people don't know that, but uh, canals were very popular throughout uh, the 1800s and by, still by 1932 they were trying to consider uh, building uh, canals around all the rapids on the Ottawa River so we would have lost all of those uh, great rapids that we use for rafting and gained uh, a way to get to Georgian Bay by powerboat. Thank goodness it didn't go through. How many people you're planning for? Again, like I said before, I was planning for me and my sister. When I say I, I didn't really let her help at all because I thought she was going to mess stuff up. So <laughs> if you pre-scoop your powdered milk, I did this for all of our dinner meals, not so much for cereal because I wasn't sure when we were actually going to eat cereal. So I would just scoop out everything so I could just put it all in one pot. And that made it easier because I didn't have to worry about messing up measurements because I always do. Pasta. So here's my uh, variety of pastas that I like. So you can do your typical sidekicks, knorr kind of thing. Uh, bacon carbonara is my, you know, it's my specialty. And you can also do craft dinner. It's like a, I don't know, everyone needs craft dinner, right? And it's actually on sale at Food Basics right now <laughs> for $5.97, a pack of 12. So, you know, I'm going to pick up mine tomorrow. Don't always buy name brand. Fun fact, no-name Frosted Flakes are actually better than the real ones, and I think you get a little bit more. Light, not the dark, but the light of the silvery moon. Not the sun, but the moon. I want a spoon, want a spoon, want a spoon. To my honey, I'll prune. Love's tune. Honeymoon, honeymoon, honeymoon. Keep it shining in June. Keep it shining in June. By the silvery moon, last line again. By the silvery moon. The, the title wasn't my idea, but I'm going with it. Okay, so there we go. So this is Canoe Polling 101. Glad you've all signed up. Try this fastener canoe. You can stop. You can go dead sideways. The original true name for this thing is a setting pole. So it's to set your ferry angle, and then you can move across. Wait for it. I get across here, give it a little push. And one more, look at the speed. Boom, and I'm not working hard. And your rubber thing. So the idea is, is, if you could push straight back, you'd be perfect, but there's nothing back there. So lower angle as possible. Reach high, 
you bend over, and then you try and, like you're bending over and you're sitting down. It's like the guy in the tug of war point. So in the tug of war, he's trying to pull those guys this here. Me, I'm trying to, my feet are on the bottom of the boat, plant as best I could, and I'm going to push my boat forward. Okay, it's not, I'm making it sound hard, it's not that hard. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to convince you. It be, oh, I started canoeing after taking a whitewater tripping course from a guy by the name of Hap Wilson. Soon after I was hired as his assistant guide, probably because he saw the passion I had for paddling, or perhaps it was because of the passion I had for him. Uh, for three years, we operated an outfitting and guiding business together until I paddled off into the sunset on my own. It would take 18 years before our canoes would, path, would cross paths again, but that's a story for another day. Canoe tripping taught me determination and courage. It gave me whole body strength. I knew I needed strong, a strong physical strength while battling headwinds, um, strong current, portaging heavy loads, hauling them over obstacles. But I also needed mental strength when a Gore-Tex jacket failed in a downpour or when battling insanity due to bugs. While I was achieving these strengths, um, I gained them not by fighting nature, but adapting to it. Canoe tripping also gave me strength of spirit. Um, it gave me strength to persevere through difficult personal losses in my life. It also gave me the strength to follow through and not wa walk away from things. And if you, you think about it, when you're on a trip, on a canoe trip, and you know, you come up a lot against a lot of uh, difficult situations. And if you just gave up, you'd be stuck out there. And it could be a matter of life and death. And so it really forces you to know that you have to push your limits and just keep going. How the hell do I manage to paddle across the North American continent solo by canoe in one season? Quite easy. I'm Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Spitz and I got into the tent. I always bring him into the tent with me because, you know, Wolves, coyotes are a big enemy for him. And uh, as soon as I got him in the tent and zipped it up, he turned and looked at the tent and started barking. Oof, 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 oof. And I'm going, what? Be quiet. Go to sleep. We had 18 hours in today. Go to sleep. Oof, oof, oof. So finally, I got frustrated, zipped open the tent, and I said, there, what do you see? And there was about a 200-pound black bear, not 20 feet away from the tent, sitting down, just looking at our tent. And I was just like, well, don't just sit there. Go get him. Get out of here. It's, it was so much fun to see that, that uh, love and compassion that we're known for as Canadians come out into so many people when they heard about when we were coming by, literally going right out of their way to come paddle with us, come share drink stories. And it's, again, fun. I am trying to encourage as many people as I can to get into a canoe and try to go for it. This year alone, we left from Bella Coola, and our first portage was 880 kilometers, so I never, ever want to hear anybody bellyache about a one-kilometer portage in your life, <laughs> ever, no matter how muddy, no matter how mosquito-y. Uh, it took us 30 days, and we went through snowstorms, rain, every kind of weather you can think imaginable, fire. Um, it was incredible, but we pulled it off.